Heavenly Father, this morning, we've been rejoicing in you through music, through stories, through prayer, and I ask that you'll help us to continue seeing you in the words this morning. May we sense your presence. May you push us and challenge us and mold us and make us something that glorifies and honors you. Let us hear you now in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first pastor position I ever had was a youth pastor. I was an intern in Greenville, Tennessee, up in the Appalachian Mountains of Greenville, Tennessee. Beautiful place. There's nice people up there. And as a youth pastor, you always have events that you get to do. Pastor Mark Reams, I mean, the guy, he is nonstop planning things. It's awesome to watch his strategic abilities as he's planning things and getting things lined up. I had to do all that same stuff back in the day. And one of the things that we did was a canoe trip down the Nolichucky River. The Nolichucky River, it's named after Indians, and it weaves and winds its way all the way through the countryside of Northeast Tennessee until it gets to the Davy Crockett Dam. Here's a picture of the Davy Crockett Dam right here. It's beautiful. beautiful. Davy Crockett was born on the riverside of this uh, river. And uh, that, this little building on the left is the old hydroelectric plant where the Tennessee Valley Authority would use the hydroelectricity to boost all the energy to go everywhere else. I know this dam very well. I've got memories here. I've been hiking around there. There used to be a bird sanctuary there. Uh, my first day of school at Greenville Adventist Academy, uh, we, we moved in the middle of the year, and so I'm the new kid in first grade coming in. All the kids know each other, but nobody knows me, and I'm the, I'm the new guy, and first day of school, I didn't want to go to school at all. And my dad said, okay, let's go for a drive. And so we drove around. We ended up at the bottom of this dam, and we looked at the water, and we prayed together and talked together, and then he took me back to school, and I went inside. <laughs> But it's at the bottom of this dam that we started our canoe trip. In fact, I resurrected a picture from way back when of the day that we went. Here's a picture of, this, of the crew. There we are, some 20, 25 of us. You can see Jen and me right in the dead center in the back. Um, she hasn't changed a bit, has she? What a babe. <laughs> Oh, what a good crew. Lots of good people there. In fact, the, the guy on the bottom right in the red swimming trunks, that's Keith Nelson. He was the principal at Greenville Adventist Academy when I was there. But you probably know him if you've been to Camp Kalakwa because he's the zookeeper there now. And he goes way back. He's a good guy. So we got the canoes there. I'd made an appeal at church the week before that if you had, had a canoe that you didn't mind us using to let me know. And I'd driven all over to collect all these canoes and we dropped them off, sunscreened everybody, water in the canoes, and we, we took off. It's just a couple of miles down the river and it was a beautiful, perfect day for it, just enjoying the rapids and just moving along. Now there were three guys, TJ, Nick, and, and um, ooh, uh, Tim, TJ, Tim, and Nick. Tim's the guy on the left side there in the orange life jacket there. They're bigger youth guys. You know, these are like ninth graders. I mean, they're, they're some big guys. They chose to ride in the same canoe, and it was a beautiful canoe. Let me tell you about it. It was an old town canoe. Do you know those, that brand? Bob Burns is the only one in here that knows old town canoes. <laughs> They're, they're good canoes. They're like high quality. It's kind of one of the nicer brands. Beautiful forest green on the outside, a beautiful tan interior. And these three big fellas get into that canoe. We're going down the river. There's some shallow spots. Um, you could scrape the bottom a little bit with sticks and some stones down there, but no big deal. We kept it going. We get to the end and we get to Klaus Svensson's house. He owned property on the side of the river and he had a fire pit ready and we had worship and stuff and pulled all the canoes out of the water. The next day, I load the canoes up on a trailer and I, and I schlep them around Greenville, Tennessee trying to get them back to their houses, except for one canoe. It was the green old town canoe, the nicest one we had. It belonged to the church treasurer. His name was Ed Bermudez, excellent guy, really good guy. And he said, Matt, I live so far out in the country just leave it at your house and I'll come pick it up. And I thought, that's great. So I took the canoe and I leaned it up against the side of our house. A few days later, Ed and I get together. He comes to the house and I, I come out and I say, hey, Ed, man, I just wanted to thank you so much for letting us use your beautiful canoe. It was by far the nicest canoe that we had here. Just a beautiful, beautiful canoe. And, and I said, you know, there were some low spots in the river and uh, it, it probably has a few scratches and whatnot, but it doesn't have any holes. And as soon as I said there aren't any holes, I looked down and there was a hole the size of my fist in the bottom of his canoe. And, and for a moment I thought, what's going to happen here? Because I've just told him that there's no holes in it, yet there's an obvious hole in it. What would he do? Is he going to believe me that this is the first time that I've seen this? Or is he going to think, 
Pastor Matt's trying to pull a fast one on me. And I just say, point out the scratches, but not the huge hole in it. And I thought, oh, what is going to happen? And he simply said, Matt, I believe that this is the very first time you've ever seen this man. It's okay. We can get it fixed. And let me tell you, that feels so good when someone gives you the benefit of the doubt. It's funny to me that Christians, all ages, adults, kids, high school students, it doesn't matter, all ages struggle with giving the benefit of the doubt. There's something inside us, and I'm sure sin has a lot to do with it, but we naturally want to accuse people of not having our best interest in mind. We naturally want to point fingers and say, you did it, it's your fault. You did it on purpose, in fact. When in reality, we have no idea. And while I don't think that giving blind trust to everyone is the best move, I do think there's a core principle of a disciple of Jesus here, and it's giving the benefit of the doubt. In fact, Jesus gives us a clear picture of what giving the benefit of the doubt looks like, and it's in the greatest story ever told. This morning, if that's not the first thing that comes to mind when you have some kind of conflict and you, want, and you don't want to give the benefit of the doubt, then this is for you because there's room for you to grow in your walk with Jesus. Here's the story. It's the most humbling experience a human has ever experienced. The story's in the Bible, and it revolves around the greatest story ever told, the one that the Bible revolves around. It's the story of redemption where God becomes human to save sinful humans for all eternity. Here's the context. Jesus has already been um, on trial. All of his disciples have basically deserted him. Um, people are yelling at him. People are spitting on him. He's been whipped. He's been stripped naked for the whole world to see. He's been mocked and made fun of. And if anyone had any excuse or reason to be angry, it would be Jesus. There's a mob that is formed. People from all over the place. People that have problems in their own lives. People that are frustrated with the government and what they're doing. People that feel mistreated. People that aren't from the same city, people that aren't the same gender, people that aren't the same ra race, people that disagree on all sorts of agendas and different topics, but they've come together for one reason, and that's to kill the Savior of the world. Jesus, he stumbles as he walks down the Via Della Rosa, that cobbled street there in Jerusalem. I got to go there not too long ago. In fact, I took a picture of, of a street there. It, it, you can see it on the screen here. It's probably not the Via Della Rosa, but we did walk down the Via Della Rosa. It looks just like this. Blocks, stone, just these steps. They're slippery. Our tour group was about 50 people wide, and you can't fit more than 50 in one of those streets. And I can only imagine this mob as they've surrounded Jesus. They're pinching in tight on him. They're, they're as close as they can get so that they can spit in his face and that they can slap him aside and punch him and kick him. And Jesus just continues down the road with one part of the cross on his shoulder and one dragging on the ground. You've got the centurions, the guards. They're the police officers of the day. They're there too. They're stuck in the middle between this riotous crowd and the condemned person. They don't know where they need to be. Do they protect him or do they join the crowd? And as the angry, rioting mob moves their way down the street, I can only imagine what Jesus is feeling. He doesn't respond with hatred. He doesn't yell back. He doesn't even wrinkle his face in anger. He silently suffers under the load of humanity's sin. And as he stumbles under the weight, the guards grab a young, strapping man named Simon. He's a foreigner. He's not even from there. He's from North Africa. He's just a traveler going through, yet somehow he gets mixed up in this mob, and he's grabbed by the centurions to carry Jesus' cross. He's thrown into service to carry the load that no man should ever carry. Ellen White, one of my favorite Bible commentators, she writes in the book Desire of Ages, she writes these words about Simon's experience. Here it is on the screen. The bearing of the cross of Calvary was a blessing to Simon, and he was ever after grateful for this providence. It led him to take upon himself the cross of Christ. I mean, can you imagine that experience? He sees the Savior. He carries his cross and for his, the rest of his life, he gives his heart to Jesus. That's powerful. And there's something about carrying the cross of Christ 
that even though it's a burden, even though it sometimes makes life hard, it's the greatest commitment and, and service you can ever do. It's an honor to serve him like that. And Jesus and Simon the African, they stumble their way down the stone steps there in Jerusalem. And as they're going, they hear something. It's weeping. It's people crying. Jesus, in the midst of his agony, he hears something else. It's a group of women. It's these ladies that have seen Jesus for who he really is, the Savior, the, the, the giver of life. They've seen him, they know that it's him, and they weep as they see him being mistreated. And Jesus, in the middle of his agony, he stops to listen to somebody else that's hurting. I mean, that's the God that I know, a God that cares when you hurt, that even in the midst of whatever he's doing, he pauses and takes a time out because he cares about you. He stops to think of their life and their experience and their struggle and their journey. I mean, that's the God that I know. In the midst of agony, he thinks about you. And I can't help but see the application for my life and your life here. Do, do you ever get caught up with whatever it is, things that are heavy, things that are painful, things that are drama in you, your life, and we get so caught up in them that all we can see is ourselves? I think we all do that. And even as Christians and disciples, even though we're called to be others-centered and you first, me second kind of disciples, we sometimes slip into narcissism. And we only look at ourselves and what we've got going on in our lives. Why is it that we become so desensitized to everybody else? It's like we don't care what other people feel, what they've got going on, the tough stuff that they experience. And, and what happens when we do this is we assume the worst of somebody else. We assume that they have our best interest last. We blame others and we point fingers and we decide that if anybody has any different opinion than you have, that they must be your enemy and they're against you. And when we get this way, we can never see their perspective. We can never give them the benefit of the doubt because we just can't see who they are. And Jesus, whose ears are in tune with those that are hurting, even though he's hurting, he says these words in the book of Luke. He says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. He says, weep for yourselves and for your children. Jesus says, I know I'm hurting. I know it hurts you that I'm hurting, but don't weep for me. Weep for you and your children and on down the road all the way to 2021 and beyond where the world gets worse and worse and worse. Weep for them. Don't worry about me. Jesus thinks of others in the middle of his pain. He looks to the future, to the time when people, it's so bad that people crawl for the rocks to fall on them. This morning, I don't know what you're feeling, but I know there's lots of pain in this room. Might be family pain, might be work pain, might be struggles with health. Uh, the pastoral staff, we pray for, for you every single week. And, and a lot of these prayer requests, we, we read through them and, and pray for them. There's a lot of pain right now. Why are you hurting today? What's the pain that you feel? The mob, they're, they're around Jesus and they continue to move up the cobblestone streets and they're, they're moving to the place where they crucify people and they, they get the cross out and they lay Jesus on him and they pin him down like a trophy. And as the cross shakes down into the ground, his body racks in pain, yet he doesn't yell words of hate. Instead, he yells words of mercy. I mean, that's the God that I know. And while he hangs there, he makes an appeal on our behalf on the behalf of the enemy, on behalf of the ones that are wounding him, on behalf of the ones that hate him. And he gives the benefit of the doubt as he appeals for you and me. Here's what he says, Luke chapter 23. He says to his father in a prayer, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh man, it would be so much easier if Jesus said, God, get rid of them. Father, they know exactly what they're doing. They're killing me and they know it. Yet he says, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because I've been in their shoes. I know what they've experienced. I know their hurts and their pains. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's have mercy on them. Let's show them grace. And isn't that what the benefit of the doubt is? It's giving grace. It's undeserved grace. It's grace to someone that you don't know what they're thinking. It's you don't know if they're giving you the, the best interest. That you don't know what they're like and yet you give them grace. Not too long ago, 
I went to Costco. You guys like Costco? Yeah. Any Sam's Club members out there? Yeah. Oh, we got people raising their hands. All right. We all go to Costco for the samples, right? I do. It's the best place in town. You hungry? Don't want to spend any money? Go to Costco. Get some snacks. Maybe get a piece of pizza on the way out there, like $1.99. I'm walking in the parking lot, heading to the front door. There's cars going by, and there's a lady that's heading my way, and I'm heading her way, and, and, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to pass each other, because it's kind of skinny through here. And, and so she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her, and, and so I, t- I take a step to the right, and she moves that direction, and so I go the other way, and she moves that way. Now we're getting closer and closer. You've done this before. And we're back and forth. It's like we're doing this awkward salsa dance in the parking lot of Costco. And finally, we get it straightened out, but there's some tense like, m- movement there, and people are a little cautious about space these days, and so I- I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and as I-, I get real close to her, I look into her eyes, because that's all I can see, because she has a mask up here, and I tell her, I'm smiling behind this mask. <laughs> she says, me too. <laughs> but for that brief moment, I thought to myself, does she think that I'm doing this on purpose? Like, does she, she can't see me. She doesn't know what I'm, what, am I smiling or am I angry? She, she has no idea. I have no idea about her. And that's so often the times when we have to give the benefit of the doubt. It's when you can't see and when you don't know. And so you have to give the benefit of the doubt because you have no idea what's actually happening. The benefit of the doubt happens when we don't know and can't tell and can't see. And we give the benefit of the doubt because that's what disciples of Jesus do. Disciples always assume the best of others. Disciples give others credit for good. Disciples give grace before it's even needed. Disciples always trust first. And when we give the benefit of the doubt, we mirror the God of the universe who, even though he knows the end from the beginning, even though he knows our heart, he still gives us the benefit of the doubt. And I can't help but fall more and more in love with the Savior and my Redeemer because he does that for me. About a year ago, I was still pastoring in Marietta, Georgia. Awesome church, incredible people. It's a congregation of about 1,100 members. It's a, it's a big church, it's a wonderful place. It's at the heart of a crossroads of homelessness. It kind of reminds me of a popka. We have a lot of homeless people here. So oftentimes we'd see people around campus. On a Thursday morning, really early, that's when I always write my sermons, Thursday morning, as as early as I can. Usually, sometimes it's 3.30, 4 in the morning because it's quiet and there's no one around and my my mind is clear. So I I was driving to the church and Marietta sits on the top of a hill. You guys have been there. And up on the top of the hill, there's a driver that goes up. And as I'm driving up the hill, early, early in the morning, there's a man that's walking up towards the church and I think, This is weird. What's he doing? Eh, no big deal. I pull into the parking lot. In fact, here's a picture of that church. I'm sure you'll recognize it. It's the classic A-frame church that every other Adventist church is like. Uh, We're in one now. Right there in the green lawn there. I mean, it's pitch black, but I saw something on the grass. So I pulled my truck around and pointed the headlights right out there. There was a tarp on the ground, and there was a woman laying on on the tarp with a jacket covering her. She was sleeping there. It was not the first time we'd seen that. I pulled my truck into the parking place, turned it off, I got my bag, and as I, as I headed to the door, I thought, what do I do here? There's no, no school that day. It just happened to be a, a break. No, no school. There's not going to be kids there on campus that day. Uh, I don't really see any immediate issues or, or any danger. But I walked over to them. The man had come up now. The, the two of them were there. And I, I said in the most gracious way I could, I said, hey, Good morning. It's fine if you're here now, but when the sun comes up, you, you need to be on your way. And they said, thank you. And I went inside, started working on my sermon. A couple hours later, the sun comes up, and I, I go into the sanctuary, and I look out the windows to see if they're gone. You know, you'd expect that, right? And, and the, the man was gone, but the woman was still there laying in the grass. And my heart went cold because I thought, I was the nicest guy in the world to them. I could have said, get out of here. I could have called the cops on them, but I said, no, you can stay until sunrise. The sun is up. They're still here. At least she's still here. And and for a moment, I wanted nothing to do with giving them the benefit of the doubt. What What my heart said was, they're doing this on purpose. They're disobeying because they don't care. 
And then for a moment I thought, but I wonder what it's like to be in her shoes. I can't imagine being homeless. I wonder what it's like to sleep without a bed, without a room, with cars whizzing by all the time and and lights and noises all the time. I, I don't know what's happened to this lady. I wonder if she's been abused in life. I wonder if she's addicted to something. I don't know what's happened, the hardships that she's faced, and I wonder if just a good night's sleep would do her good. I thought about it some more, and I thought this is an opportunity for me to do what Jesus has done for me. Me to do for her what Jesus has done for me, and it's to give her the benefit of the doubt. This morning, I don't know the person that you connected with or resonated with in the story. For some of you, you'll resonate with Simon, the guy that carries a heavy burden. It's not even his, but he's got it on his back. Maybe that's you. Maybe your whole life you've carried a burden. Maybe you were born that way. Maybe it's how you look and you carry this burden. Who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt? For others of you, maybe the person that you resonate with is the woman that's weeping. Pain in your life, suffering in your life. Who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt? For some of you, you're the centurions, you're the guards, and you're caught in between two things. You're caught in between what you know is right, and you're caught in between what the mob is doing. Who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt? Others of you, uh, you're just another voice in the crowd that's yelling. You've got a strong opinion, you've got a strong agenda, and so you just yell like the crowd does. Who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt? Maybe this morning you don't resonate with any of those people in the story and you're struggling to find your place. And if that's the case, then your job is just to listen because the Holy Spirit will tell you, who do you need to give the benefit of the doubt? May each one of us be willing to give the benefit of the doubt, even when we don't want to, as we do our best to to look more and more like Jesus. Let's, Let's... Together. Heavenly Father, today as we, as we close our service, we rejoice in the grace that you've given us. May we give the benefit of the doubt to others. God, we love you, and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.